Welcome back to the Yahoo Finance All Market Summit. Moderna has had a historic rise from a small biotech to a major vaccine player in the past two years. The company just inked a deal with Merck to license its cancer vaccine candidate and has a growing pipeline targeting other diseases. Joining me now to discuss all this and more is CEO Stefan Bensal. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us once again. Absolute pleasure to have you uh, with us at this summit. Thank you so much for the invitation. I want to start off with the news. Obviously, that deal with Merck, really big game changer for you guys when it comes to just the trajectory of the company. You're no longer on your own. You're no longer just a COVID company. Things are moving along. Tell us about this deal. Yes, yeah, so we are very excited that Merck decided to exercise their option on our personal cancer vaccine. You might recall we've done a partnership in 2016 where Merck funded the manufacturing infrastructure for cancer, the phase one and the phase two that is still ongoing. The phase two full readout will come in Q4 this year. So we're talking a couple of months now. But Merck decided recently to exercise the option so that we're going to be 50-50 profit share as partners. As you know, Merck is the leading company in immuno-oncology. The product is being tested in combination with Ketudra. And it's really, I think, hopefully the data is positive when it comes out in Q4, but it will be very transformative for patients because that's a, a personalized product we make for every human being, starting with the sequencing of their DNA. So that could potentially be a total game changer in cancer. Yeah, and this, I know you've been waiting for me to ask you about anything but COVID, right, at this point. You're just like, please ask me about more than the COVID vaccine. Well, now's your chance because I also want to ask about all the other uh, candidates you have in your pipeline. You do have an RSV candidate that you've been pursuing as well as a combo of flu and COVID uh, candidates. So talk to me about that and where we're looking, especially for respiratory diseases that we know are still on the horizon for this winter. Uh, what, what are you looking at when it comes to the timeline for these other candidates? Sure, I mean, as you say, and as you know, Moderna is a platform company, and unfortunately, most people know us about COVID. We're very, of course, thankful and grateful for the ability to help that we had with the pandemic and still now with the Omicron booster. But Moderna is a platform company. So let's start with vaccines, where indeed, in addition to the annual updated booster, uh, for COVID, we are going to get in Q1 of 23 of phase three data for flu. And we have feedback from the regulators like the FDA that that study should be enough to file for the conditional approval of a product. So we could have a product for flu on the market in the fall of 23 and in a, uh, a few pro countries around the world. Then, as you say, RSV could also come around Q1 timeframe, this one is a bit more difficult to know because it's a, a case basis. So we need to have people basically contacting the disease that we had uh, in the, the COVID phase three study. But that should come in the, the Q1 timeframe according to current epidemiology analysis. And then of course, the combination. As you know, we are working with a COVID plus flu in a single dose. Also COVID plus flu plus RSV in a single dose. So you see Modana really pushing the, the vaccine portfolio for respiratory disease, but also for latent viruses, those viruses that once in our body are in the body forever. We're working on HIV, we're working on CMV, EBV, the virus causing mononucleosis, for which there is no vaccine on the market. So we are trying to build a very large franchise around vaccine. Then we spoke about cancer a minute ago, and then another big news that we shared at our annual R&D day in uh, September uh, last month was some early indication I think we need a couple more months, but we start to look good in rare genetic disease, where we inject the mRNA IV going into your liver to basically give the instruction to the kids that have that genetic disease of a protein that you and I have in our liver that makes us not sick. And so we think it's a very large opportunity as well. Those products should move very quickly to the market because you do your phase one, two directly into patients. You do not go in healthy volunteers. And if you have a good signal in the clinic, you go very quickly into a pivotal. The regulatory agency helps you to move fast because those kids have no hope. There's no treatment today on the market for those diseases. So that's a third pillar of Moderna. And as you know, our partners at Vertex uh, have said that before the end of the year, they will file to the FDA and IND to go into the clinic with yet again another fourth technology for Moderna to inhale mRNA, in this case uh, against cystic fibrosis 
So you can see the company is vertical expanding. And in each of those verticals, because we have a platform, the ability to scale very quickly. Absolutely. Talk to me about that, because it seems like not only do you have the pipeline and the, and the platform, but also now you have a robust manufacturing network. So how does that play in with what you built up through uh, uh, the pandemic to what you can now do? And that's an excellent question. Indeed, COVID accelerated the company by around five years in terms of a manufacturing infrastructure. As you know, we today, today have a plant in Norwood, Massachusetts, in Switzerland, but we're also building in Canada, we're building in the UK, we're building in Australia and in Kenya. So very strong network across the world. And so now we can scale this platform. As you know, the pharmaceutical industry is a world of analog medicine. If you look at any great pharma company or great biotech company, there is no correlation between two of the assets because the chemical structure is very different. Well, in case of Moderna, all of our drugs are made with the same technology. We just changed the order of a nucleic acid. The, the, the code of life, you know, the four letters of life, like software is made with zeros and ones, and we go at it again. If you look at it today, we have 26 vaccines in development. 26. That is almost as large as the entire vaccine in clinical trial by the rest of the industry combined. And you're going to see us doing the same in rare genetic disease. Uh, if we have good data with Vertex in the lung, you will see us bringing many more uh, drugs against lung disease. And again, the cancer vaccine is yet another example of what can be done with mRNA that you could not even think about with other technology, which is we make a drug for every human being that's different. You could not do that with a small molecule. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about that, because obviously COVID set up the company to do more. You had the validation with getting to the getting your first commercial product out there. And everyone still, unfortunately, like you said, just knows you as the as the COVID company. But you are now with relationships with the FDA. You are able to get some of these candidates uh, further ahead. But there also is some competition in some of these sectors, such as RSV, such as cancer. So do you feel like you've set up the company now that you're at a position where you can compete with some of these traditional players? Definitely. I mean, if you look at it uh, in terms of R and D scale, you know, with 46 program, we have more program than most biotech company and looking like a kind of mid-sized large pharma company. You know, we have many dozens of drugs that are in the lab right now that I will expect in the next 12 to 24 months to move into development. So would I see a world in the next 12 to 24 months where we have 100 drugs in development? I think it's highly possible. And we have a capital for it. We should forget Moderna has around $17 billion of capital, which is an incredible number for a biotech company only 10 years old. And so we are really accelerating and I think that from a manufacturing standpoint, as we discussed, we have a very broad commercial network. And then in, in the countries, you know, we are today present in 11 markets, the top 11 markets in terms of EBIT margin around the world. We're opening another 10 countries this year. And so we're going to be basically present in most countries and where we're not directly present, we're going to use distributors. And so I do think Moderna is getting ready to compete with large players like we have done. In the vaccine front, if you look at it, you know, GNJ had a vaccine, you know, Novavax had a vaccine, you know, AstraZeneca had a vaccine. And at the end of the day, the mRNA technology showed the superiority of a product and the ability to update the product with uh, variants very quickly, which is why mRNA is the de facto technology now for COVID. So talk to me about the COVID market now. You're still in it. It's still a significant portion of, of revenues, right? So you do have to still pay attention to that. Talk to me about the global market. You just mentioned all the uh, countries you're in. I know there's also a lot of focus on the health equity aspect. And Moderna has been has a track record of you know slowing down clinical trials to ensure equity, to opening up uh, the doors for the uh, mRNA hub in, in Africa, and also uh, distributing at low low income uh, low tiered prices. So how do you see the company now with all these other candidates playing with within that same realm? Do you see this continuation, and do you have the room to continue? Uh, distributing to low and middle income countries as well? Sure, I mean, those are great questions. So first, the commitment that Moderna has to fight COVID forever, because as you know, the virus is not leaving the planet, is unconditional. We believe we have a massive public health responsibility to always update the vaccine 
to bring the best possible science to protect people. We believe people are going to need once a year a booster. As you know, this year it's a bivalent. It has two mRNA in the dose. But if in the future we need three mRNA, four mRNA to give the breadth of coverage, we will do so. That is our commitment. And then, as we discussed, we're going to combine this with flu and other respiratory virus to make it easier for people uh, to get uh, strong, broad protection against many viruses. Also to reduce healthcare costs. As we know, when you go to get different vaccination, the cost of administration is a big part. In some hospitals, it's actually higher than the cost of a vaccine. So I think there's a big role we can do there. And in terms of low-income country, actually this morning, we've announced an extension of our partnership with COVAX for 2023. Uh, we think it's really important that the vaccine is available at cost for low-income countries. As you know, the plant in Kenya that Moderna is building with our own capital is yet another proof of our commitment to low-income country. And so we want the products to be available to people around the world, not only in people in America. I'm glad you brought that up. I saw that uh, announcement. And, and I wonder, uh, when it comes to the mRNA platform, let us let me get nerdy with you for a second here. The mRNA platform does have that quick, very strong efficacy that we saw, but also does wane, as do uh, most uh, protection. We do see that with the antibody titers. But is this something that you are looking at? Is it something that needs to be changed or tweaked about the platform to give longer, maybe more uh, stable protection? Or is this just how the technology works? So I think we should not forget with COVID, which is the virus has changed a lot. And if you remember when the virus was mutating very slowly, like Alpha and Delta in 2021, you saw great performance of a vaccine. We should not forget that with Omicron, the genetic drift was so gigantic in only one step that I think no vaccine with no technology would have been able to hold efficacy of infection strongly because it's linked to antibodies. And antibodies wane with time that is not linked to mRNA, that is linked to our immune system as humans. The piece that is very important to see is that despite the lowering of efficacy against infection, the efficacy against hospitalization and deaths are still very, very high. Mm -hmm. And that's because, as we believe, there is very strong T cell immune memory component in terms of a technology. So I think it's a bit like flu. You know, you need to get an annual flu shot, not because the protein technology is not good. I believe it is really good, but because it's a different virus. And so you need to re-educate your immune system for this different virus, especially if you're at high risk. Again, a 25-year-old who doesn't get an annual flu shot, are they going to die? If they have no comorbidity, highly unlikely. But a 60-year-old person that has a commodity factor needs their booster because their, their antibody is a very important component of their protection. Right. So I'm so glad you brought up the, the annual flu shots because we know that people's quite, the one question that everyone has is, is the COVID vaccine going to become that? Is it going to be an annual COVID booster for a very long time to come or maybe for the rest of our lives? And how do you, you know, how do you merge that with the fact that there's already low uptake of this new variant booster? So I think it's interesting. The uptake is actually stronger than seasonal flu from the data I've seen recently. So we have to see toward the end of the season, what does it look like? It's the first time we're going to be more in an endemic setting than a pandemic setting. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll be smarter in a month or two. But the current data shows that it is a better uptake than seasonal flu shot. And I think it's going to be like the flu, which is, again, if you're 25 years old, do you need an annual booster every year if you're healthy? You, you might want it to protect other people. You might want it because you don't want to get sick and miss work or miss vacation or so on. But I think it's going to be very similar to flu, where the key is going to be people at high risk, people above 50 years of age, people with comorbidity, people with cancer and other condition, you know, transplant, uh, and that's really important to think about. And if you look at it uh, around the world, that is 1.5 billion people. So it's a lot of people that are going to need an annual booster. And people that are younger are uh, going to have to decide for themselves what they want to do. I mean, the example I always use is myself. You know, I've been taking a flu shot for the last 20 years. You know, I just turned 50. So in my 30s, in my 40s, I took an annual flu shot. Is it because I was worried of being hospitalized? Of course not. I just didn't want to be sick. I wanted to be able to work. And I believe that the best thing we can all do in medicine is prevention. And vaccine is one of the most amazing 
healthcare tool will all happen. So okay. I took a vaccine against flu, so I didn't get sick, and so I could, you know, have a normal life and work and take my vacation, be with my friends and family. <laughs> Something we all want to be able to do, especially during the holidays. CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bensel, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation.